The client and the server are two concepts that you're using already, but many people don't actually understand, and myself included for a very long time. It took me probably about two years of development to really understand what was going on and even just get the fundamental difference between what's running on the client, what's running on the server, and I think a lot of this confusion came from the fact that I started with Firebase and React and all this stuff, so the line between client and server is really blurry there, so what's happening where didn't make a huge amount of sense, so I want to make that a little more clear today with a couple examples nice little diagram the typical stuff but before i get into that obviously well first of all i'm back we got a ton of stuff done over the month of december a lot of behind the scenes work upgraded all the equipment camera mic should look a lot better sound a lot better um there's no more there's no more bed in the background i tried to make this a little nicer but i sort of realized that i have a tiny 10 foot by 10 foot room and it doesn't have anything on the walls i can't really do anything with it i tried a green screen and then i realized that i have awful green screen hair the curly stuff just doesn't exactly work for that so just running this i think this works it's a lot better than it used to be and you know you're not here to see the background so Got all of that done, really glad to be back, gonna be working on a ton of stuff over the next few days and weeks, not entirely certain where all that's gonna go, but we'll certainly keep you updated, and for those of you who have been here before and are coming back, really appreciate it. If you're new, make sure you like, subscribe, do all that stuff. I'm gonna be getting very aggressive with the growth, very aggressive with everything we're putting out, and I'm very, very excited for this new year. So, without further ado, let's start breaking it down. All right, so starting off, I made a nice little diagram for this. I think it's the easiest way to sort of get an idea of what's really happening, and let's start with the client. So the client is everything that runs on your end user's device. So when I'm looking at this app right now, I'm on Excalibur. So everything that you see here is being run on my device. It's all client side code. Whenever someone says client side, they mean the stuff that's executing on your device. So that would be stuff like the JavaScript in your browser, the HTML, the CSS, and in the future, the Wasm. I don't think, I don't know of any products that are using Wasm, but I know it's coming. And what Wasm is, is it's WebAssembly. So it's basically assembly code is what runs at the lowest level on a computer. So they're kind of trying to do the same thing with web browsers with WebAssembly. The issue is browsers are really, really optimized for JS over the years. As silly of a language as JavaScript can be, it's really well optimized at this point to the point where, you know, it's still a JS app will typically run faster than a Rust app on the client in a web browser if you're just comparing V8 Engine to Wasm. So something to keep in mind that basically all the time it's going to be JS code running in your browser. So whenever you're actually writing code for an app, this will be basically your front end framework. So whenever someone says a front end framework, they're basically talking about the stuff that's going to be executed on the stuff that's going to be executed on the end user's device. So we have React, Vue, Svelte, Angular, all these different JS frameworks. All of the code you're writing in React in a single page app, that's going to be executed on the end End user's device instead of up on a server. Now that gets a little blurrier when we get down into Next and Nuxt, which I'll get into a little later, but for now, just assume if you have these sort of single page app frameworks, those are going to be run in your browser. As a side note, what a single page app is, is this basically means that all the code is going to be run through a single HTML page. So. Whenever you boot up a Create React app, you're going to end up with a directory structure that has an index.html within it. And if you look at that index.html, you have a little script tag in there, which is going to execute your bundle of JS. So this bundle of JS is what actually is running. And that's what actually can simulate if you go to like another page, a, a, like a, a routing package like Tanstack Router or something like that. That will be how you simulate going to different pages, but it's actually not going to a different page. It's the same HTML page, just changing what's rendering based on on the JS that you provide for it. The development experience on that is phenomenal. It's really easy to develop. It's really fast. It's really nice. Now, the issue that you do run into there is you don't have, you lose some of the capabilities that you get with a multi-page app or a sort of hybrid framework like Next or Nuxt, where a huge issue you're gonna run into is SEO, because if you think about it, you have that one HTML page, well, all of the meta tags at the top are static and fixed. So if I need to change, like if I wanted to say like pricing page up here and then home page, it can't do that. It can only ever say whatever your company site name is. So you get one pick for your title, one pick for your icon, one pick for your description, all that stuff. So it's more ideal for like a dashboard type thing. But if you're doing like an e-commerce site where SEO is super important, you kind of need these hybrid frameworks or maybe a traditional framework like the Django or Rails of the world. Although I don't think that those, those have really fallen out of fashion lately. And I don't think that they have that much use anymore. So with that out of the way, a big thing that you need to also understand about client side code and stuff that's under rendered on the front end is the end user can see all of your code. So this is something that 
really tripped me up for a while and I think is really important to understand is that anything you put in the client code, so anything you put in your React app, the end user can technically see it. So if you go ahead and if I went in here and I, um, so if I went in here into a new tab and I hit inspect, if I look at this right here, I can see all of this code in here. If they had any secret keys or whatever and any API calls in here, I could see all of it. So it's really critical that you design your app in a way that you don't put any secrets on the client and you make sure that all of that is done on the server. So like your database connection string should never be on your client. You should never be connecting directly to your database. Uh, you should never be running Prisma. You should never be like connecting to a Mongo instance ever on your front end, unless it's in a very specific scenario, which I'll get into in a minute here. And that's gonna be the like pocket-based, Firebase, um, that sort of service. So then another thing is that the front end is only active when the end user is active so you can't do like schedule jobs on it you can't do it doesn't persist so you got to kind of design with that in mind the client is also limited by the end user's power this is really not that big of a deal anymore i mean most devices have gotten so freaking strong that it doesn't really matter what you run i mean don't run n cubed time algorithms in, on your front end that's not wise but if you're just doing basic stuff like iterating out a list, showing some uh, cool animations, running basic stuff like that, it's not gonna be a problem. So performance is not usually too big of an issue, although if it does get big enough and complex enough, it can start to slow down and there do need to be optimizations if you get that crazy. But more than likely, as you're starting out and learning, you won't be doing that. So. Getting into the server, I'll do these like hybrids last. The server itself is very different because this is running on a separate instance in the cloud. Now this could be a serverless instance, which would be like a Lambda, which basically means that whenever you fire a request, it will spin up an instance, run your run whatever you told it to run, and then spin it down. So you are, you're only ever build for what actually runs. And then there is the like normal, traditional, just compute instance where you basically just get your own little box in the cloud. You get a little CPU, and then you can do whatever you want with it. So you can spin up anything you want, expose, whatever, it doesn't really matter. You can just put that up there and it will run all of the time however you want it to. So that's the sort of server side. And on the server, we can do very different fun. We have very different functionality available on the server. So on the server, we can do stuff like authentication. We can do stuff like databases. We can do stuff like heavy computations. And the reason why we can do these is because A, it's not running on the end user's device, so it can run any time. So like a heavy computation that'll take 10 minutes, we can just make that a background job, push it off to a separate instance, run it in the background, no one will know or care. I do that a ton on my company site, Insider Viz. We have to do a lot of data aggregation stuff. I do all that server side, and it just kind of happens in the background. The end user would never even know what's happening. So we have heavy computations, and then we also have stuff like authentication and database. These are very important things because when you're thinking about client and server, security is an important thing that comes up because obviously when you have an app out there, your database connection string is invaluable. That is like the key to your app, and if that leaks and someone gets a hold of that, they can take down your entire thing and it's a huge mess. Very, very bad if that happens. So that has to be protected on the server and to protect it on the server. Well, it just is protected because you can't access like the end user can't access the code of your server. They can't see what's happening up there. So everything you run up there is secret and especially, well, you should be using it as an environment variable. Those are super easy to configure wherever you're hosting it. You put your environment variable on there, run it, it's fine. So your database is, you're able to connect to it and run queries from it on your server. So the sort of flow is you make a query to your database on the server and then send that data down to the end user. And the way these two connect, uh, the way these two communicate traditionally was always a, via REST. So HTTP requests, but these days some more different alternatives alternatives have popped up. GraphQL was a huge one about 10 years ago that got super popular super fast because it effectively added some type safety to your front and back end, added a really strong contract between the two. Really great. I like GraphQL a lot. I don't personally use it because I don't really have a use case for it, but for bigger apps with giant teams, it's a great solution for communicating between the client and server. But the one of the most popular ones that's come up is TRPC, and I'll sort of touch on that with Next.js. But Basically, these two have to communicate some way, and typically that's done via REST, at least traditionally it was. So you can make a request to your server, it'll run the database stuff, it'll run the authentication stuff, and then it'll send it back down to the client. So the client can make requests. Then we have, like I said earlier, 
schedule jobs. And the key is this can run all the time. So obviously in a serverless infrastructure, you're not going to be running it all the time because it spins up and down as you make requests. But if you needed it to, if you needed like a background worker, which I do for my company, because we have to constantly be fetching data, I just have a nice little background worker running and that will be constantly going, constantly fetching new stuff and getting all of that done for me in the background. So then down here, I have some examples of like what would be client side technologies, what would be server side technologies. Prisma is the sort of, I mean, it's an ORM, but it's also sort of a query builder. It's sort of, it's very different. I'm going to talk about that later in another video, but like if you compare it with the Rails ORM and then to like comparing Rails's ORM to Prisma, they're very different and Prisma is a lot better. So Prisma, you got Fiber, which is my uh, HTTP framework of choice for Go. Jin, another HTTP framework. I don't like it as much, but it's very, very popular. Nest.js, the sort of black sheep of REST frameworks for um, Node. Wouldn't recommend it, but I figured I'd include it. Then we have Express, the sort of golden standard for just normal HTTP requests. Super lightweight, super easy to use, super intuitive. Great stuff all around. Then MongoDB, this is my, well, it's not my database of choice. I think SQL is probably the best overall, but it's a database that I use a lot and it's sort of to illustrate that databases are connected to and queried from the server, not from the client. Now we get into the sort of Next.js world and the Nux.js world. So I don't have a huge amount of experience with Nux, but I know that on paper it effectively works the same way as Next, although it lacks some of the features. So looking at Next.js, Next.js is a fascinating technology because it has both a client and a server. So Next.js will expose a, anytime you're like in the pages directory or whatever, this is pre um, app directory stuff. I'm not gonna be talking about that right now. So just assume this is like the next 12 pages directory type stuff. Okay, so to illustrate these sort of client server concepts in Next.js to really give you an idea of how all this works, I went ahead and I spun up a very basic create next app. So in this case, I'm just gonna be doing this to illustrate via HTTP. So to get started, we have our pages directory. So like I said earlier, the pages directory is all React code. So this index.tsx, this is just a React app. All of this is gonna be executed on the client. So if I added any like script tag in here, so if I added like a use, um, use effect, and then this will execute twice because React is a very fun framework that works exactly how you would intend it to. It's not jank at all. But regardless of my complaints about React and use effects being very silly, we uh, you can see right here the hello from client is being executed on the client. So this console over here, anything you see within this console is coming from client side code. So all this stuff in here, anything within this export default function home, executed on the client. Great. Now this will obviously change a little bit when we get into server side components, but for the sake of today, don't think about those. Just think about normal React app before we get into server side components, which I will have a lot of stuff on in the future. I still have a lot of learning to do on those. Those are wild, but very cool. So another thing we can do is we can then do some server side stuff in here. So say I wanted to fetch from my database on this page. So Next.js exposes something called get server side props. Now, this is sort of, again, going to be deprecated by the new the new app directory system. But for the sake of example, I think it's worth uh, showing like right here, if I do export const, um, Okay, so right here, what I just did is I spun up a get server side props. So get server side props will execute every time I go to this uh, route. So every time I go to the index page, it will run get server side props before the page is loaded. This is very similar to the sort of traditional, um, what, is, what is it called? The traditional, there's like the, why can I not remember what that's called? It's the, um, MVC, yeah, MVC. So this is very similar to the traditional MVC apps. So the model view controller stuff where every time you go to like a, you go to a certain route, a controller will fire and then that controller will run on the server and that will pick out what view you need and then it'll render the view. Here, we're just kind of running this on the server beforehand. So I wanted to do console.log, um, hello from server. I can go ahead and do that. And then whenever I go back to this page, if I refresh it, um, we can see right in here, hello from server. So all of that is being run server side, really useful. If I wanted to do database calls in here, I could. I can also go into this app direct, into this API directory and I have this guy in here. So this is just going to send back John Doe. If I go right in here and I do localhost 3000 slash API send, it's gonna give me a 404 because I'm trying to get when this is at hello. So if I do API slash hello, 
We run this, we get John Doe back. So this is a server side call. Anything done on here is run on the server, which is not being exposed to the client. And then everything that's run here is being, then everything in here is on the client and not the server. So hopefully this gives you a sort of idea of how all this stuff works. It's really, really critical that you sort of get a good mental mapping of how all this stuff works. It's something that I didn't get for a long time. Um, one of the big caveats here is the like firebases and pocket bases of the world those work a little differently because for a firebase app it's all clients so like i mean you could have a server with it but typically the way you're going to see it is it's just like you're going to use some single page app framework like react or view or whatever like viewfire has gotten really popular and pretty cool uh they're doing some really cool stuff there view's not my thing but looks pretty sweet so in the react world they're doing all that stuff or sorry the firebase world they're doing it that way where we have a react app and then we have a firebase app and then you add the Firebase SDK to your client side app, and then you can connect to Firebase and Firebase becomes your server. So Firebase is your servers. Everything on Firebase world is executed on their servers, but you don't have to think about a server yourself. You just have to have client side code, which will then connect to it. It makes for a very quick and easy app development experience. I've messed with it a little bit recently. It is kind of insane how quickly you can put stuff together, but you sort of then get locked into, well, now they have your back end so all of your server side stuff is on firebase and if you ever want to migrate off of it best of luck so kind of a give and a take there but hopefully this gave you a good idea uh thank you for watching have a phenomenal day